Hello everybody. Uh, you are listening to Through Time and Clades. My name is Albert. And I'm Joan. So, it's uh, it's been a while since our um, last episode. Uh, it turns out that we didn't really have time to, um, to, to record another episode last month, so uh, we are, you know, uh, kind of... Uh, coming around to October now, and so it's time for another news episode. Um, but uh, but yes, uh, eventually we we will do the um, dinosaurs the second chapter update. Don't worry, uh, we will get there. But uh, but yeah, um, I guess uh, before we jump in, um, how have you been uh, these past few weeks? I've been doing pretty well. Um, not too much major to report in mm -hmm. terms of life events. Um, work on the house is is going smoothly. Um, we are likely due to begin construction in November. Um, so y'all been like hearing me talk about this property for, you know, ever since the beginning of the series, uh, things are coming to a head a lot mm. quicker than I thought they would. And that's, that's really exciting to hear. Um, this wonderful little space that we've been carving for ourselves. Um, and uh, let me think, I know for next week, I'm going to be in Maine. Mm. That's going to be fun. I haven't been there in three years. Wow. Um, and that's going to be a really important trip. Because mm -hmm. the last time I was in Maine, you know, I had to go to my grandmother's funeral on my mm. dad's side. And uh, you know, that that's always a bummer. Yeah. Um, and, you know, it's been quite a while since we've been. And things have changed. And, you know, family is moving to different places. Like locations that we used to go to all the time are different from... How I remember them, <laughs> and it'll be interesting to see how that has happened, you know, by going to, on this trip. But uh, I think at the end of the day, it'll be it'll be a nice time with the family, mm. and uh, we're gonna really enjoy ourselves. Um, oh my gosh, pop culture wise, though, uh, all kinds of things I've been into. You know, <laughs> the MCU has been having a stranglehold on mm. me for several weeks. Um, especially since the the series What If has been coming mm. out and it just finished. Yeah. Um, oh, what a delight. Um, I think I'm just more surprised that, like, this is canon. Like, this, is, <laughs> this series exists because of what happened in Loki. Um, and we're just exploring the consequences of what had happened in that earlier series. And, oh, my gosh, so many possibilities now. I, I, I'm very curious if characters that have appeared in this will appear in subsequent films. I mean, it's um, basically official fan fiction, which is an oxymoron, but I mean, yeah. Yeah. Oh my gosh. What if is the Cinderella three of Marvel projects, <laughs> <laughs> which is always fun. Um, yeah. And I uh, uh, got to see Shang-Chi mm -hmm. recently. That was a, an absolute delight. Um, and yeah, the cinematography, the characters, uh, they're doing some interesting things at the MCU. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm definitely looking forward to it. Um but I guess of more relevance, just just a, a quick thing to talk about, because mm. uh, this has been on my mind very recently. So NBC has this new show called La Brea oh, that right. they've been promoting. And it they've already had their second episode this week. So it's it's been out for a little while now. And, of course, everybody in the paleo community, or at least that, that has cared about this, has been asking the same question. Like, is it good? Is this going to be an accurate representation of Pleistocene North America? Because the whole premise of the show is folks in California, there's a huge sinkhole that just sucks a bunch of people and objects into it. <laughs> and then they wake up and they're 10,000 years ago, or no, 12,000 years ago. Um, but of course, like they don't know it yet. They're like looking around what the heck is going on. We're in like a nature place and there's like debris everywhere and everybody's confused. And then like weird things start happening. Like there's giant birds and there's dire wolves um, and then camels show up. And then everyone's starting to think like, okay, maybe something, something is off about this. Um, and then of course there's a saber tooth cat. And, and, and then it's like, wait a minute, these things are supposed to be extinct. What's going on? Um, and eventually like it dawns on the characters that, oh wait, we've, so we've somehow been transported back in time. We're still where we are in Los Angeles, but we're now, you know, it's now in the past. Mm. Um, and so, like, it's kind of like the basic premise. And, and they're, they're doing this thing where it's like it's a survivalist sort of drama. And all the characters are, are different tropes. Um, and it's 
not good. I, <laughs> the show frustrates the hell out of me because a lot of people were suspecting, like, oh, this is going to be bad. It's mm-hmm. just from the previews. Um, and it is. It's very bad. Um, <laughs> none of the characters are likable. They're all annoying as hell. Um, the tropiness of the characters is, like, almost to, like, cartoonish levels. Mm-hmm. Like, they have the character who's, like, a bumbling fool. They have the character who is, like, a strict... Um, selfish character um, they have the ones who is like very fundamentalist and they take those traits and they just blow them up mm-hmm. to like unrealistic proportions to like like to the point where like people don't talk to each other like this like right. it's it's so frustrating and i mean that's to say nothing about like the actual quality of the special effects and, and the creatures in this because the, the, i mean I, I get it tv budgets right mm. but wow um some of the some of the imagery could have made could have used a couple more renders um the animals are of varying quality because that's that's what we care about right you know all 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 us paleo folks like how how do they do all these famous ice age creatures Mm. and it is very very mixed um they have terratorns which we've talked about in in albert's series Mm. um and they've kind of like made them look weirder and more prehistoric quote unquote so like right. we talked a little bit about this terratorns probably well, well they probably didn't look like blown up turkey vultures you know they still would have had like a, a raptorish sort of look to them yeah but they give them like these weird like casks like a cassowary oh. on their bills <laughs> um and of course they're always they're always yeah. screeching oh, of course they have yeah. like, shaggy, like dirty feathers like something out of horton <laughs> here's a who um <laughs> And of course, they're just absolutely enormous. Like they're probably way bigger than how a terratorn is supposed mm. to be. Um, the dire wolves are just gnarly wolves, you know, <laughs> snarling things. Like, right. They they wouldn't look at a place in like Twilight or something. Mm. Um, there's some live action dromedary camels that they just let out loose on the set. <laughs> um, I guess that they're supposed to be camelops, which was a, an extinct species. Um, and of course, the saber tooth is a it's like it's a beefed up lynx with leopard spots as as these things are usually shown mm-hmm. um, in popular culture so like that it's very very mixed and apparently we're due for other creatures too um the next episode they're gonna have like a ground sloth mm-hmm. and it's a big shaggy thing that isn't like not it's like walking on its palms which is i guess is kind of weird yeah. um uh and then there's like a, a giant snake for some reason <laughs> it's right. prehistory you gotta have giant versions of things um because keep in mind like there are no there's no evidence for any like 15 foot snakes in the labrea right, like, right. The, that's not a thing that we had during that time um and and yeah oh uh, it's albert i'm sure you haven't had the chance to watch this at all so you've been mostly taking my word for it yeah yeah pretty much (laughs) yeah it's um y'all are more than welcome to watch it i don't think it's particularly worth it i think i might give it at least one more shot see what this next episode is but i'm i'm probably going to be done after this because Mm. man i I, it it, it's one of those shows that is fun to joke about as you're watching it Mm -hmm. you know if you want to give it like the mystery science theater 3000 treatment you can certainly do that um because that's what me and my dad have been doing um (laughs) but oh gosh and like there's just so many it's one of those things where like you can know a direction a show is going from in just the first couple of minutes Mm. because the tropes are so prevalent like oh the characters are going to do this oh this is going to be a major plot point um my biggest worry and i think I know what they're actually going to do with it, and I hope that they do this sort of thing, because if they if they don't, it's going to look really bad on their part. Hmm. But there are a couple of shots here and there of, like, hand stencils on rocks. You know, something similar to what you see in Paleolithic art. Um, well, at least in Europe. Um, and there are a couple of shots of characters who are noticing the people who have fallen, you know, from the sinkhole. And they're like they're dressed in animal skins, so they're very clearly in like Ice Age ish garb. Um, but like the actors that they use are like clearly white people. Mm. And I'm hoping that this is just oh, these are people who fell in the sinkhole, you know, a while back, and they've just 
become desensitized to Ice Age life, and now they're just embracing it. I hope that's what they're doing. <laughs> um, otherwise, they're implying that these are like straight up like Paleolithic people, like Paleo Indians. Um, yeah, no, no, <laughs> you got about that all wrong, and and that's just ugh, that's that's gross if that's the case. I don't think that's the case. I'm I'm hoping it's not. Um, but I guess that remains to be seen, depending on when they decide to bring bring that plot point up. Because oh my god, the show is slow. Mm. Like it's two episodes in, and they still haven't figured out where the hell they are. Like they're spending <laughs> all this time picking up the pieces and, and introducing these characters that it's just dragging on. Like we know what <laughs> we know, I, and these are characters that we don't care about. I don't care about <laughs> these characters, and I'm forced to stick with them. And like they open up like thirty different plots at the same time. Mm-hmm. It's like I don't care. Ugh. <laughs> um, so. Yeah, in terms of paleo media, this is what we have right now, and <laughs> it is not impressive. Mm. I, I'm, I'm, the series is not even done, but I'm giving it like a friggin' negative two out of ten. <laughs> <laughs> That's my answer to that. A glowing review, I see. <laughs> oh yeah, um, you know, if you like the show, whatever. Um, <laughs> That's all I have to say. <laughs> but. Yeah, that's what I've been up to. How about you? Yeah, um, so for for me, um, I guess um, the several weeks uh, uh, off that we've been taking uh, have been pretty good for me as it goes um, thesis writing. Um, So I've made pretty good progress on that. Um, In fact, um, I am essentially done with my first draft of... um, the uh, the main text portion of my thesis basically um Woo-hoo. yeah yeah that's uh, pretty exciting um so what's really left for me to do um is uh i need to um put together the figures to illustrate uh, this last chapter that i'm working on um and uh that's coming along uh, it's kind of uh, you know wrestling with it but um once that is done uh, and hopefully that won't take longer than a- another couple of weeks um I can send that off to my supervisor for comments, and uh, yeah, yeah, then I will be um, pretty much ready to um, submit uh, my thesis to my um, examiners, um, and eventually we'll have a uh, what we call a PhD viva, where they will question me about the, the thesis and then decide whether I get my uh, degree or not. Um, so yeah, no pressure at all. But um, <laughs> but but no, it is it is actually really exciting to to get to this point and so yes uh the light is kind of there at the end of the tunnel so that, that's good um yeah um uh pop culture wise i haven't uh, been up to too much because of you know thesis um but um, but uh yeah i did watch the uh, the new my little pony movie on netflix um, and for those of you who uh, who uh, follow me on anywhere else other than this channel. You probably know that I, I'm a fan of My Little Pony. So uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, they're starting a, basically a new generation um, of like characters and setting right now. So uh, that that is interesting. I uh, I'm intrigued for the uh, new series that they're gonna they're gonna um, do uh, fo- to follow up the movie. Um, but yeah, that that's uh, that's not too relevant to uh, our our uh, themes uh, of this uh, this podcast. Though, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Um, I still haven't. Um, done too much work for our uh, website yet uh, because of again thesis um but uh, i promise that uh, when i once i submit my thesis i i, I will start uh, getting around cranking on that and uh, writing my part of the website uh, parts of the website rather um i'm pretty excited to, to get to work on that that's for sure oh yeah it's definitely been a um a fun project I, i've taken a little breather myself um <laughs> i had a really bad fever recently so oh. I, I was bedridden but there was like a little silver lining to it in that I could get some reading done, um, which is relevant because, so I, I, um, I just finished Jeremy De Silva's first book, his new book, uh, First Steps, How Upright Walking Made Us Human. Hmm. And that was a very insightful read. Um, I, De Silva is a really great storyteller. Um, his writing style is really wonderful and he has a big heart. I can tell that in his writing and, and a lot of like the things that he's talked about, you know, especially regarding making science more accessible by making specimens more accessible, I think is very important. Um, 
couple of eye-opening details that he mm. revealed there that we don't have to get into at this moment. Um, but like being able to like read through those works that are so new, I'm able to use that for the website. Mm. Um, so I'm, I'm currently writing through the notes to Humanity Prologue, and I'll be able to summarize what we've come to know about hominins over time. And one of those things you learn is that there's a lot of details there that are actually like more controversial than I thought that they were mm. and a lot less concrete than I thought that they were. Mm. And so in learning these, I should be able to add that to the notes and bring a little bit more clarity to things. So that was kind of really fun. Um, yeah, I finally read that. And then I finally was able to read um, a book that De Silva was a, uh, an editor on called A Most Interesting Problem. Uh, how Dar what Darwin's Descent of Man got right and wrong about human evolution, which is just a great idea for a book in the first place. Mm. Um, it reminds me of another one that I really love um, by uh, Besnick, uh, who did that for The Origin of Species. You know, sort of a sort of a chapter by chapter look at what Darwin wrote and then what we know today about the subject material, which is a fascinating learning experience and. Uh, yeah, that's the only resource I recommend. Like, if you want like a SparkNotes version of like where we are in terms of paleoanthropology, um, I, I check those out. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's a wonderful book, and uh, I know there's a little bit of discourse about certain parts of it in, in the paleo community, um, uh, especially regarding the um, the 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 claims that Darwin was racist. Mm, um, yeah, which that, that that's a whole other can of worms. Um, all I'll say on that for now is that I think the claims are very well founded and it's not as controversial as it right. should be. <laughs> um, and I think people get hung up too much because they really like Charles Darwin as mm. a figure and they want to have him with no faults whatsoever. Mm. It's not how we're supposed to do these things. Um, right. you know, sci scientists, naturalists are people. Um, and they have the same biases that everybody else has, even mm -hmm. if they try to be objective, which right. is very, very difficult. Um, and so I think a lot of that was blown way out of proportion. Mm -hmm. um, like the, 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 that particular chapter concerned was not, it's not really controversial, um, especially if you actually read The Descent of Man itself, which clearly each of these authors have done. So there shouldn't be any issues here. Um, but, you know, these are the sorts of things that we deal with in, in the in the various scientific communities that we're a part of mm -hmm. you know, we're not monoliths that's for sure you know we all have opinions and ideas about the world doesn't necessarily mean that they're right opinions but that is the situation that we're in yep. um but uh yeah that's kind of been an interesting experience and so yeah hopefully i should be i, I hopefully i'll have time to get back to work on the website too um i'm definitely very excited mm -hmm. as well to be able yeah. to share this with everybody it's going to be great yeah yeah definitely exciting and I, I know you've already done quite a lot of work on it already so yeah uh looking forward to, to seeing more <laughs> definitely definitely yeah all right uh i guess that's our uh that's our intro uh, material um uh kind of our, our updates uh, about our, our lives and so do we want to get go on to our new stories yeah absolutely i believe one of your stories is first uh, looks like you're right. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, head on over to the next slide. And uh, we will start covering our first story of this episode. Um, so this story that I picked out um, is about vocal learning in musk ducks. Um, all right. So uh, we talked a bit about uh, vocal learning a, a couple times in my series, Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, so vocal learning is abil the ability to learn basically sounds and then vocalize those sounds. Um, and this is a pretty rare ability among animals. Um, of course, um, we are capable of vocal learning. That's why that description should probably sound pretty familiar. Um, it's how we learn language after all. Um, and uh, it seems to have arisen uh, also several times in some groups of birds, um, primarily um, in hummingbirds, in parrots, and in songbirds. And there are a, a few other groups of birds that might uh, have vocal learning as well. And in fact, uh, the new study I'm going to talk about here um, adds at least one more to that list. Um, 
And so this is a very interesting study on a particular species of duck, um, the musk duck of Australia, which is an extremely unusual species. I pictured on this slide um, a male individual. And you can see, uh, you know, just visually that <laughs> this is a very unusual uh, species because this male musk duck has a, a big dewlap hanging off its, uh, its lower jaw. Um, and uh, that's definitely not something you see in most ducks. Um, so uh, they use this as part of their courtship display. Um, and in addition, where they get the name musk duck is that they actually produce a, a smelly secretion uh, from their... Mm. Um, uh, preen gland. So this is a, a gland at the base of the tail, which most birds have. Um, it produces an oil that they use to waterproof their feathers with. Um, and in musk ducks, it also produces a kind of smelly um, kind of um, uh, secretion that uh, I'm not sure if we know what, what it's really for, but uh, uh, perhaps it has to do with courtship as well. Um, and when they are performing courtship, uh, male musk ducks will kind of flaunt their little uh, the dewlap uh, on the bottom of their jaw. They'll also kind of make these kicking motions against the water and also produce these whistling calls. Um, and so they uh, kind of do, do all these activities to try and attract the attention of, of females. Um, and the, those whistling calls actually will be relevant uh, to this story later. Um, something else that's kind of weird about this species is that it, it is extremely aquatic, like even for a duck, uh, that spends most of its time in the water. Um, and if it comes out on land, uh, they are actually kind of awkward, it is said. Um, they're, not, they're not very good at walking around. Uh, so these are basically um, seal ducks, uh, you could say. Um, in fact, I, I first learned about this species from an article by Darren Nash, uh, the author of the blog Tetrapod Zoology and a British paleontologist who constantly gets mentioned in this uh, podcast. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, he, he wrote an article about like weird um, facts about uh, waterfowl, well, actually a series of articles. And one of the articles was about the musk duck and how weird it is. And yeah, he mentioned that this is basically a seal duck that spends most of its time in the water and rarely comes out on land and uh, is not very good at walking when it does. So yeah, kind of kind of unusual. Um, they, they like to nest um, in a kind of vegetation that's uh, overhanging or like floating on top of the water. Um, so even when they're nesting, they don't really come out on land very much. Um, and uh, they are able to fly. Uh, they, so they'll, they'll fly to get from bodies of water, uh, between bodies of water. Um, but yeah, other than that, uh, most of the time they are you know, um, pretty much aquatic. And uh, they don't seem to be closely related to any other living group of um, you know, living species of duck. So obviously they, they, are, they are ducks themselves, but um, they, they, they don't have any especially close living relatives, so they're kind of on a weird little branch out by themselves. And uh, yeah, that's uh, definitely very odd. So all in all, this is a, a very strange species. And uh, the study that I'm um, talking about today uh, kind of makes them even weirder. Um, so um, it turns out that the, there have been a number of reports uh, about um, musk ducks being able to mimic sounds and uh, that definitely would be a very unusual ability for a duck if that is confirmed because ducks are not among the groups of birds that have been confirmed to exhibit vocal learning um, and this ability has not really been reported in in any other um, species of duck yet there there have been these uh, these anecdotal reports from you know pretty reputable sources uh, you know experienced researchers and people who keep birds. Um, so what's up with that? This, this study basically dug up some old recordings of uh, musk ducks um, that uh, were held in captivity and uh, purportedly were doing this kind of vocal mimicry. Um, so there were two authors on this study, Ten Kate and Fuligar. Um, and the second author, Fuligar, was actually the one who uh, recorded uh, these, um, these sounds of one individual in 1987 and of one individual in 2000. Um, now, both of these musk ducks were housed at uh, the same uh, nature reserve in Australia. And uh, in fact, they uh, they, they, were, they had uh, gotten exposed to each other at some point. So uh, it is possible that kind of, um, as we shall see, the, the second one might have picked up some of these, these calls from, from the first one. But um, 
basically, yeah, the, the first one um, was a, um, uh, both of these musk ducks were male. So uh, the first one uh, was a male musk duck who had been uh, reared by, by humans basically growing up. Um, and so it turns out that when he performed these uh, courtship displays uh, and uh, he would incorporate into these uh, displays some pretty unusual sounds, uh, not not so much the whistling kind of call that is typical of the species. Um, so he would imitate uh, what sounded like uh, a door slamming shut. Um, and uh, what's even more remarkable is that he would uh, uh, imitate a phrase of human speech. And uh, apparently this phrase was, you bloody fool. And... <laughs> <laughs> which uh, I, I guess was something that he heard pretty often while he was being kept um, um, being reared by, by humans um, from his caretaker. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, there are recordings. Th these recordings are made available, like um, both um, like in the in the publication as part of supplementary material, and also in news articles about this um, this study. So um, yeah, you, you actually can go and listen to the sounds that this duck was making, and it, it does sound pretty convincing, <laughs> like uh, like a person. Um, and so what the authors did was that they, they took these rec these old recordings, which had not really been scientifically analyzed before, and then they kind of um, kind of compared them like to the original sounds that uh, they are thought to be imitating, and were able to you know demonstrate that yeah they actually are substantially similar to these noises. So it is quite likely that uh, this duck was indeed like uh, repeating these noises that it heard while it was growing up. And the uh, the second uh, duck, the, the one that um, was recorded later in 2000, um, he would also make uh, uh, noises that seemed to be similar to that slamming door noise. Uh, and it, it is quite possible that he picked up this noise from listening to the, the first duck um, uh, because they had gone, they, they apparently had met before, according to the paper, um, or at least had, you know, been been in close proximity to each other at the nature reserve. So these, these ducks are pretty territorial. You don't want to keep them in quite the same same kind of space. Um, and in addition, uh, the second duck would also imitate the calls of a uh, different species of duck, Pacific black ducks. Um, uh, so and incorporate them into into his displays. So yeah, uh, pretty convincing examples of vocal mimicry in this species. And in addition, the authors also report additional kind of anecdotes from other um, uh, bird keepers who have uh, worked with the species and mentioned that uh, they uh, uh, they they didn't have recordings, but uh, supposedly that they they had um, that heard uh, these ducks mimicking things like human coughing noises um, and and such. Uh, so yeah, several several um, uh, accounts that seem to corroborate uh, this uh, that this behavior exists in this species. All right, so uh, it seems that. Uh, vocal mimicry is a thing in musk ducks. So why is that the case? Um, well, it seems that uh, there there is some evidence that the courtship vocalizations, that the whistling noise I mentioned earlier that are made by male musk ducks uh, during courtship uh, is likely to be learned um, because while these ducks are growing up, um, kind of immature males will sometimes like make these whistling noises. Um, but b before adulthood, they, they don't quite make them uh, make noises that are identical to the adults. Uh, so they're, they're sort of like practicing. Um, and they start making these noises after they've heard adults uh, nearby, like uh, making them. Uh, so yeah, they basically mimic uh, what the adults around them are, are, are making. Um, and so uh, it seems that these courtship vocalizations are not innate um, in these ducks. They, they have to be learned. Um, and in addition, uh, there's also evidence that there is there are um, differences in like a uh, kind of dialect as you will uh, in different geographic populations of musk ducks so like the musk ducks in one region will make one particular kind of whistle and and the uh, some that live in another region will make a very different uh, kind of kind of call um so that is also a pretty good evidence for uh, vocal learning in this species um and something quite interesting, uh, yet another unusual aspect of musk duck biology is that uh, they are what we call a lot more altricial than other ducks. Uh, I also spoke about um, 
altricial uh, development versus precocial development in my uh, mm. bird series as well. Uh, so precocial animals are those that are uh, born relatively independent and can kind of take care of themselves, um, whereas altricial animals need to rely more on parental care. Uh, humans, of course, are very altricial. Uh, we, we are born not really being able to do anything for ourselves. Mm. Um, now, in, in most ducks, uh, they hatch out pretty precocial uh, by bird standards. Uh, Pretty much as soon as they hatch out, uh, little ducklings can walk around, uh, they can feed themselves, uh, they don't really need to be uh, fed by their parents, so you know, they'll follow the, their, uh, their mom around, usually, usually their mom, uh, they'll follow their mom around and seek safety from her and such, but uh, they, they can uh, you know, do, do a lot of things by themselves already. Uh, but uh, musk ducks seem to be pretty unusual in that uh, they will actually get fed by their mothers. Um, and so uh, in addition to that, they um, also have a much longer period of childhood. Uh, they uh, receive parental care for a much longer period um, than other ducks. So they are more altricial. Um, and so it may be because of this kind of extended childhood um, that they were able to evolve this kind of vocal learning ability um, because they you know, have that time to uh, spend learning this stuff. So yeah, I guess... Uh, this study is uh, very interesting, uh, not only because uh, it is uh, rather unexpected for a duck to be able to learn to talk like a human or imitate human speech at least, um, but also uh, it adds yet another kind of layer to how bizarre this species really is. And uh, yeah, I, I, was, uh, I was pretty happy to see that this uh, study got some news coverage because this is a very um, interesting species and uh, it's good to see it in the spotlight. Um, so yeah, do you have any other thoughts to add? Yeah, this is incredibly fascinating. It it, it makes you think about other uh, birds that have this sort of altricial development. Mm -hmm, yeah. Whether there may be some like vocal learning that we just don't know about yet. Right. It, indeed, and it, it is certainly true that like the three main groups of um, vocal learning birds, like the hummingbirds, the parrots, and the songbirds, are like you know, altricial species. Um, so it, it certainly fits in with that pattern there. Yeah, because I'm. Um... Oh, what other types of birds are altricial? Um, let's see. Uh, a lot of the um, a lot of the core land birds are um, so telleravies, um, uh, telleravians. Uh, so things like uh, many of the birds of prey are are relatively altricial. Uh, things like the kingfishers and uh, and woodpeckers and and their cousins are are very altricial. Um, let's see. Uh, pigeons tend to be altricial. Gotcha. Okay. Well, those would be good places to look. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Mm. I could usually see a study on pigeons being done fairly easily. Oh, yeah. Right. Because mm. there's just plenty of them to go around. Right, right. Um, that's fascinating. Oh, I, I, I have to listen to these recordings. Um, yeah. Just to hear a duck say, you bloody fool. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's quite <laughs> something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's fantastic. Yeah. What a really good story. <laughs> yeah. All right. Uh, so if you uh, do have anything else to add, uh, we can go on to your first story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we're going to do something a little bit uh, a little bit similar to what we did in the last news episode, mm -hmm. where uh, my first story is actually two stories mm -hmm. that just so happen to be very relevant to each other, that it makes sense to talk about them together and how timely these stories are. Um, so for this first one... Um, uh, in episode five of our series, Humanity, a prologue, you know, we talked about the Savannah Stan hypothesis, you know, the, that a, a belt of grassland and open woodland uh, appears to have stretched across Africa and into Eurasia during the early Pleistocene, and that these conditions facilitated the earliest spread of the genus Homo around the world. Now, while this is a fascinating model, it turns out that it's not the whole story. Hmm. Uh, early humans inhabited a fairly wide range of habitats beyond this, um, including even more wooded areas than the so-called Savannah stand. Uh, for example, a Dominici in Georgia, which is home to Homo georgicus, uh, was found to have been more akin to a, a Mediterranean-style temperate oak woodland with a bunch of grassy vegetation when people first ventured there uh, 1.85 million years ago. And of course, of the 
hominin sites in East Asia, which we now know to have stretched back some 2.5 million years ago, uh, do range from temperate woodland to subtropical montane forest. So right away, the Savannistan hypothesis has major problems. And we're now learning that early humans relied on a number of tropical to temperate habitats in their population expansion across the continents. Now, uh, the oldest evidence of humans in Europe dates back to stone toolkits that were found roughly 1.5 million years ago in the southern countries of Italy and Spain. Now, the oldest direct evidence of humans, like fossils, um, are found between 1.4 and 1.2 million years ago at uh, Venta Mycena, Fuente Nueva III, and Branco León in Spain. Uh, and these, of course, are relevant to this first study. Uh, these sites are located in the Guadix Baza Basin in Granada, Andalusia, so it's in the south of Spain. Um, and alongside the human evidence, which consists of for example, a single tooth, which I show here at the top and kind of pointing to where it was found, um, we have a number of fossil mammals that are associated with these fossils. Uh, we have horses, goats, deer, bison, and rhinos, among others. Now, based on previous environmental data from different studies, it has been suggested that the Guadix Baza Basin was either Mediterranean woodland or marshy wetland, or open woodland with seasonal dry periods. So a lot of this confusion really comes down to interpretations based on the mammalian fauna itself, you know, with the types of animals being used to correlate with modern type ecosystems. Mm. But there is always the possibility that parts of the world during this time had no modern analogs. Uh, for example, uh, the mammoth steppe which is an ecosystem that just does not exist anymore. Although people are trying to bring it back, in Siberia at least. So in order to try and clarify the situation, uh, Juha Sarinen and colleagues studied the dental ecometric traits of the mammals found at these sites, which basically means that they looked at the functional morphology of the teeth and you know, how they would have been used in an environmental community. And you know, that includes things like microwear analysis which we've talked about before. Um, and they also looked at body mass estimates for the different mammals. And they use all this data to estimate the mean annual precipitation, the annual temperature, and the primary productivity throughout the Guadix Baza Basin from the early Pliocene, so starting four and a half million years ago, and onto the middle Pleistocene until 400,000 years ago. And by doing so, the authors could see how the environment changed over time and what sorts of conditions early humans actually favored as they expanded into Europe for the very first time. Now, first of all, most of the mammals they examined seem to have been mostly browsing species, you know, save for a couple of the horses that they found. Um, but not all the horses, interestingly. Mm -hmm. uh, the dental ecometric and body mass data showed that the majority of the sites in the Guadix Baza Basin were most similar to both Mediterranean pine and oak forests and African shrublands, as well as areas like the Sierra Nevada Mountains, British Columbia, and Yellowstone National Park. Hmm. So basically these are woodland ecosystems with regular rainfall and quite diverse plant life. Now by comparing these to sites across Europe, including those later in time where the archaeological record is a whole lot better, the authors were able to chart the regions where the environments are far more suitable for a human presence based upon the previous methods. Uh, you can see this chart here on the slide. Uh, all the little circles in deep blue are the least suitable, while those in like orangey red mm -hmm. are the most suitable. And they're all along this gradient, which you can kind of make out in the little color bars at the bottom right. Uh, and what this shows is that the earliest humans to enter Europe seem to have maintained their presence in fairly diverse ecosystems, mostly sticking to climatically warm, highly productive habitats like Mediterranean-style woodlands, but that they also tended to avoid the more open dryland steppes, tundra, 
and grasslands that were fairly common in mm. Ice Age Europe. Now, uh, those prior mentioned woodlands, however, were fairly different from those seen today. Uh, they were Mediterranean in climate, um, but they had African shrubland-like primary productivity, and yet little in the way of actual grassland plant species like we see in African shrublands today. So in other words, you know, these were ecosystems that don't exist today mm -hmm. and are quite a far cry from the Stevanistan hypothesis, which is often based on modern ecosystems. Now, over time, as human settlements increased in Europe and species evolved, so we have Homo antecessor and the Neanderthals as big examples, then we start to see explorations into less suitable terrain and adaptations to those types of conditions. And this is especially clear in the chart on the slide, where the number of green to orange sites actually increases by the late middle Pliocene, uh, Pleistocene, excuse me. So uh, while they were mostly sticking to forested regions, later humans were nonetheless adaptable and ingenious enough to live through ever harsher conditions as the Ice Age took its toll on Europe. Um, but this is the story of the first European expansions. So what were the conditions like when our own species first made the trek there? Hmm. Well, if we move to the next slide, mm -hmm. we have the second paper by uh, Sarah Petrozani and colleagues that asks just that. So let's set aside, for example, the controversy over the remains of Homo sapiens in Europe over 210,000 years ago. Um, it has generally been thought that our species first entered Europe during one of the warmer spells of the glacial period, so what they call Greenland interstadials. Um, but new discoveries in ancient DNA research have really shed some serious light into this area of the world. So the peopling of Europe by the Western foragers of the proto orignation cultures, which established the earliest permanent settlements of Homo sapiens in Europe, were in fact the last of a series of expansions from Southwest Asia that, incidentally, those other ones do not appear to have left any descendants in people alive today. Um, these include, for example, uh, the humans at Bacho Kiro Cave in Bulgaria, who we talked about mm. in the first update special of Humanity of Prologue. You know, they were the ones who used the Bohunistian toolkit, which is one of many uh, what, what they call initial Upper Paleolithic cultures that are otherwise not very well known. Now, their presence in Europe was relatively brief, between 48 and 40,000 years ago, and it was thought that they took advantage of a warm spell to enter the region, inhabiting the lands of Eastern Europe until things got cold again and they were forced southward, and which is, of course, when the Bohunician culture ends. But then it's during the middle of their lifespan that other sapiens numbers in Europe were on the rise, having entered the continent around 45,000 years ago through a southerly Mediterranean route and establishing European hunter-gatherer ancestry right on through to the end of the Paleolithic. So what of the nature of the earlier initial upper Paleolithic arrivals? Well, the, Petr the Petrozani team used similar methods from the previous paper to analyze just what the climate was like when the Bohunicians and their neighbors entered Eastern Europe. Uh, in this case, they looked at oxygen and strontium stable isotope samples from fossil mammals that were found alongside the human remains. Mostly in this case, horses, bison, and auroch the ancestors of our domestic cattle. Uh, and they wanted to see what they had to say about the average temperatures throughout that period, comparing it to older sediment samples at the same site, going back 61 to 51,000 years ago. And what is interesting is that living in the same region as these aforementioned mammals are species like woolly mammoth and wolverine mm -hmm. and reindeer, which are more adapted to subarctic environments than the cool temperate conditions where horses and bison live. Now, some of these species are very flexible when it comes to different climates. For example, they can migrate to and from places. Uh, so by doing this study, the authors did want to make sure that they had raw data to actually figure out if this was the case and whether the samples they were looking at um, were reliable or not. And it turns out that when examining the isotopes, the team was able to confirm that the animals at the Bacho Kiro cave site 
were not migrating to and from their locations. So they actually could be used to test the in-residence conditions. Mm -hmm. So compared to the present day in the same region, uh, the temperatures during the initial upper Paleolithic of Bulgaria were a lot colder. In fact, uh, approximately 14 degrees Celsius lower than the present day. In fact, climate-wise, this area was more like Scandinavia and Russia today wow. than was previously expected. And this is a very far cry from what we previously thought. The Bohunicians who lived here were actually experiencing cold Ice Age conditions hunting subarctic adapted mammals. Now, curiously, it seems that the climate was actually getting gradually cooler as people first trickled into this part of the world. Now, at the very least, the summers seem to have been fairly good, but not much different from summers in Siberia. Mm -hmm. And if you live there, I'm sure you can confirm that it's not exactly California. <laughs> mm -hmm. Now, so while it may seem strange that Homo sapiens entered Europe during such a cold period, it must be remembered that we do have archaeological evidence of our species in the Arctic regions of Siberia at around the same time you know, using the aid of bone needle technology to sew animal skins as warm clothing. Perhaps the Bohunicians had the same inventions. Now, of course, the question now is, if the Bohunicians were not pushed away by the same cold conditions in which they appear to have lived, then what happened to them? Um, I mean, we know that they left no living descendants, so something seems to have happened. Um, and then, you know, what made the proto orignation expansion that stayed for much longer different than this earlier one? Mm -hmm. Well, there's, you know, there's hope that there will be future research that can uncover these mysteries as well. So, yeah, I, I thought this, this pair of papers was very fascinating, and it kind of reveals more information about the phenomenon that we notice about Homo sapiens. You know, we've been called generalist specialists, and it seems that we were not necessarily limited by climatic conditions in regards to where we wanted to go, so long as we had the cultural adaptations to deal with them. Mm -hmm. And this is in you know very sharp contrast to earlier species of Homo, who, according to this research, appear to have stuck with what they knew rather than tried to explore, you know, more less suitable uh, environments. Mm -hmm. Which I think is very interesting. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Yeah, um, I would agree with that, and it's. Um... It's always great to get a more kind of refined look at many of these aspects, especially kind of the, the interplay between climate and organisms is, of course, a, you know, a topic of much interest uh, nowadays uh, for perhaps obvious reasons. And yeah, I, I, I definitely I definitely think that the um, the contrast between kind of the earlier uh, homo species versus sapiens uh, in this regard um, is a real is really interesting. I, I am also reminded a little bit um, in the uh, in the first study um, of kind of the the work that has been done um, modeling kind of climate suitability in in birds, which I talked about in my series, uh, and, and trying to you know understand how distributions of different bird groups have changed over time and how that aligns with their their climatic preferences. And it's it's pretty fun to see that applied to uh, you know looking at human um, dispersal and evolution as well. So. You know, these are these are absolutely fascinating studies for sure. Yeah, I definitely love to see more of them done in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. um, yes, maybe we can clarify some things about Beringia, for example. Oh or, yeah, um, maybe like in, going into uh, regions of the Himalayan region, like to kind of see how that expansion was maintained because you know the Himalayas being what they are, right, seem to be very impenetrable, but yet we find you know remains of like Denisovans mm. and early Homo sapiens there at like increasingly earlier dates. Yes. So yes. clearly like they were doing something that was working out for them. Um, yeah, just absolutely fascinating. Um, but yeah, uh, if you don't have anything else to add, uh, we can move on to your second study. All right, uh, let's do that then. Okay, um, so my second study uh, is about uh, insects, specifically moths. Um, so I think I thought this was quite an interesting study. Uh, of course, well, of course I did, or else I wouldn't have picked it. Um, 
but uh yeah this is a this is a pretty uh, fascinating subject in general i think so um it has to do with like um the coevolution between bats and their prey so um specifically insect hunting bats um and so as you probably know if you're familiar with bats um many types of bats uh navigate and forage at night uh, using echolocation so they make these very high-pitched vocalizations uh, and you know send them out and then if those um, you know sound waves hit something uh, around them and bounces back uh, they they are able to kind of interpret the those echoes the, that echo that they um, you know that, that bounce back to them and you know figure out where the prey is, where obstacles are, and kind of act accordingly. Um, so uh, insect hunting bats are like amazing uh, predators of like insects and other, um, other invertebrates, um, very, very effective hunters. And so uh, to survive, uh, many types of insects actually have evolved countermeasures um, to uh, kind of avoid bats. And some of these adaptations are extremely fascinating. Um, and one particular group of insects that um, has had a, you know, a long history of having to avoid bats um, are the uh, moths, um, which are, uh, for most part, also nocturnal and uh, are flying insects. So they regularly encounter uh, bats at night when they're flying around. And so there are all kinds of very interesting kind of anti-bat adaptations in different types of moths. Like, for example, I know there's, um, there's one particular species of a tiger moth that uh, makes its own kind of noises while it flies. Um, and what these do is actually they will actually interfere with the, uh, the sound waves that the bat is generating. And then, you know, it kind of prevents the bat from, like, homing in on the moth and so they, they end up missing their target uh, because they, they don't they're not receiving their own echoes properly because the, the bat um, sorry the, the moth is kind of emitting emitting these noises interfering with that so yeah that, that's really interesting um now the uh, the group of moths i'm going to talk about today and is the subject uh, of the study that i'm talking about here um have a very different strategy for dealing with um with the uh, bat attacks um so this group of moths are called the Saturnid moths, um, and they include some of the largest and most spectacular uh, types of moths. Um, and in fact, uh, this study kind of uh, goes some way towards explaining uh, some of the most spectacular features that this this group of moths um, has. Now, uh, some previous studies have looked at um, certain species of Saturnid moths uh, that have what we call these. Um, they're, they're often called tails, I guess, uh, these hind wing extensions, uh, these long kind of streamer like extensions that protrude from the, the second pair of uh, wings in the back. Um, so a very well known example is the Luna moth, which is pictured on the kind of the left half of this uh, figure here. Uh, so this is a very, very beautiful uh, green um, mm -hmm. colored uh, moth uh, with these very distinctive kind of hind wing extensions. And previous studies have found that uh, it seems that one of the main functions of these hind wing extensions is as a defense against bats. And the way this works is that uh, the, um, the, the hind wing extensions will actually deflect the, um, the echoes uh, that are coming from a, a bat's vocalizations in, in a way uh, that causes the bat to miss the moth's body and instead target kind of the, those hind wing extensions instead. Um, and so if the, uh, if the moth is lucky, uh, the bat might end up missing it entirely, or if it's slightly less lucky, uh, it might get bitten in these hind wing extensions, but, you know, it escapes because it's not its main body and it is not a fatal injury. Um, so that's pretty, pretty interesting. Uh, and that seems to be a major function of these hind wing extensions in um, Saturnid moths. Um, however, not all um, types of moths in this group have these hind wing extensions. Um, some of them instead have these highly modified uh, four wing uh, structures instead. Um, so some species like the Atlas moth that's pictured in the right half of the image have these kind of extended um, uh, four wings with uh, unusual textures on the end. Um, so they have these uh, kind of ripple like structures, for example, along the surface. Um, and it, in some species, um, there are on, they only have these ripples, um, 
But in others, like the Atlas moth, there are also folds at the ends uh, of the wings, like along the edges. You can see how they're kind of crinkled um, in, in this, uh, this um, close-up shot uh, in, the, in the figure. So they have these folds and, and ripples um, on their wings. Uh, and the moths that have these uh, ripples and or folds, um, they never have the hind wing extensions. So uh, the authors of this new study uh, decided to examine uh, whether these uh, kind of four wing ripples and folds might uh, function as an alternative kind of a defense against um, a bats uh, in a similar way to the hind wing extensions. Uh, that are found in things like the Luna moth. And, and so what they did was that they looked at uh, not only the physical structure of the wings of these, uh, these moths with the, with the folds and ripples, but also um, kind of how uh, these wings interact with sound. Uh, and what they found was very interesting. So it turns out um, that when exposed to high frequency sounds specifically, so the types of sounds that a bat would be making while it's hunting, um, the uh, the wings of these moths uh, that have uh, only the ripples and no folds uh, produced echoes that were comparable in strength to echoes that would bounce off uh, the main body of the of the moth. So the kind of the uh, to a bat the the wing the wing tips of these moths would show up like equally strongly in the in their kind of sonar as it were. Um, Compared compared to the body, uh, where whereas you d you don't see um, this in in moths that don't have these ripples at all. So uh, in those moths, the the body would be kind of the strongest, uh, would produce the strongest signal and allow the, the bat to target them. Um, and in uh, in moths that have both ripples and folds, uh, the uh, the wingtips actually produce substantially stronger echoes than the body. Um, and so it's quite likely that if a uh, bat was pursuing one of these moths, they would like have a very high chance of targeting the wingtips instead. And of course, the wingtips are positioned quite far away from the main body. And so uh, it's quite likely that the bat would miss um, its best chance of actually grabbing onto the insect itself. Um, and so uh, all of this um, seems to suggest that uh, these uh, wingtip uh, ripples and folds are indeed an anti a bat defense um, that they are uh, also they also kind of serve as decoys that um, that divert uh, bats away from the main body of these uh, these moths. So uh, if we plot out these features onto the phylogeny of Saturnian moths, onto like a you know, basically a family tree of these species, um, you can find that uh, both hind wing extensions and the four wing folds and ripples evolved many different times within this group. Um, but you never see them in the same individuals. Um, in fact, in, the authors actually point out that there's a species of moth, I think it's called the, um, the Hercules moth, where the males have these long hind wing extensions, whereas the uh, females have uh, four wing ripples, uh, but no hind wing extensions. So uh, yeah, you never see both types of structures in the same type of individual um, moths at the same time. Um, so these are alternatives to each other um, and they don't function together. And the author suggests that the reason for this is that perhaps if uh, a moth has both uh, uh, rippled four wings and kind of long hind wing extensions, they might kind of, the effect might kind of cancel each other out and end up centering the echoes on the main body of the moth instead, which is of course, you know, it's the exact opposite of what, what they want. So yeah, uh, it seems that these are kind of alternative strategies um, to one another. And finally, the authors, well, finally, in terms of what I'm going to cover here, uh, they of course uh, discuss many other fascinating things in the paper itself. Um, but uh, they also discuss um, Basically, why don't we see more moths with these with these hind wing extensions or these folds and ripples if these are so effective um, at diverting bat attacks? Um, and the reason uh, probably is that uh, these structures uh, only work well if the um, if the moths themselves are particularly large species. Um, the Atlas moth, for example, is a very large species of moth, and the Luna moth is a pretty pretty large one as well. Um, 
because uh, if you're a very small moth and you have these uh, structures, they're probably not going to make enough of a difference to, to save your life, basically, because your wings are still really close to, to your body, so it's not like uh, if a bat misses, it's going gonna, it's gonna to miss you by that much. Um, it, it is really cool to kind of figure out you know, why why these animals are the way they are. Uh, even if you're like me and uh, you're not all that familiar with insect diversity, you know, it, even if you have only a passing interest in insects, you probably have seen pictures of Luna moths um, or, um, or Atlas moths and, and seen how spectacular they look. And uh, it is really cool that we have these studies now that tell us why they look that way. Uh, and it turns out that this is part of a very elaborate kind of anti-predator defense. So yeah, um, I thought this study was really interesting. Uh, what do you think? Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, I mean, it certainly kind of brings home the observation that being a giant bug in mm. the world today is a, a tough job. Yeah, <laughs> right, right. Because, <laughs> um, I mean, so, oh my gosh, so many animals eat insects mm -hmm, that... Mm -hmm it makes absolute sense that they would be really ingenious adaptations like this to kind of combat that in some way. Um, especially for moths like this too. Um, I mean, as far as I understand, many moths, when, when they reach the adult stage, it's mostly for reproduction. Um, like they're not, they're not feeding um, right. or anything like that. And so you want to kind of safeguard that stage mm -hmm. as long as you can, you know, so that way you can you know mate and pass on your genes to the next generation right you know without worrying about something looking at you as like a tasty snack right that is just right there and easy to get compared to other smaller bugs mm -hmm. um, that's remarkable yeah i mean I, I can imagine for an atlas moth at least um like like the frequency of those ripples would probably like go to a bat and the bat would be like oh it's another one of my friends i'll leave him alone <laughs> <laughs> Which is that's wow, that's remarkable. I'm, I'm definitely very familiar with Luna moths. Mm -hmm. Growing up at my at the old house, uh, yeah, I used to see them quite a bit, and yeah, they're a sight to behold for sure. Um, and uh, it's kind of exciting to know that like this particular group, the uh, the Saturnids, are they have a fairly global distribution, and like every country has like their own version of yeah. a Luna moth, for example. Which is that's got to be fun. That's got to be great. Um, yeah, that's a really fascinating study. <laughs> yeah, uh, but uh, you know, if we don't have anything else to uh, add, uh, I guess we can head on to your final story. Sure, absolutely. Um, this one, oh, this is a fun one. It um, is. <laughs> <laughs> so as alluded to several times in Humanity, a prologue, uh, humans around the world have turned wild animals into pets for many thousands of years without domesticating them. And this can range from insects to mammals. Um, you know, domestication of animals is not a prerequisite for their use in rearing and resource harvesting. And I think that's, that's a pretty important lesson that you learn when studying this sort of thing. Uh, I mean, the one example we used in episode 10 uh, were the couscouses of the Solomon Islands mm. and New Guinea, uh, which had been transported from island to island over a period of 20,000 years for use as a pet, as well as for food. Well, this paper by Christina Douglas and colleagues concerns New Guinea as well, and describes another wonderful example of this phenomena, this time with a flightless bird known for being fairly dangerous in the wild, mm -hmm. the cassowary. Now, of course, if you'd like to know more about these birds, you can check out episode two of Albert's series mm -hmm. on Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Um, so, by studying the remains of microscopic structures uh, of fragmented cassowary eggshells at two rock shelter sites in eastern New Guinea, uh, Yuku and Kiawa, the authors found evidence that humans have been relying on these birds for at least 20,000 years, going back to the last glacial maximum during the Pleistocene. Uh, cassowary eggs go through distinct changes in the pitting of their shells as the young develop inside the eggs. And these can be seen in the preserved remains. And so they basically tell you what stage of development the embryo was in mm. when it was harvested. And a curious pattern was found in the 1,019 shells that were examined at these sites. Eggs were being harvested 
during the very latest stages of embryonic development, when the birds inside had already formed limbs, beaks, the claws, and the feathers. You know, they, would, they would look like baby birds. And so they're, like, they're right about to hatch within a few days' time. Um, and there's greater evidence of burning, so of course people taking the eggs and cooking them, uh, on the earlier stage eggs than the later stage eggs. So, you know, people were cooking the eggs when the young had barely begun to form. And so the eggs are mostly yolk and albumin. And the same held true for middle stage eggs as well. It's in contrast, the late stage eggs were often allowed to hatch and were only eaten on occasion. Now, we do have ethnographic evidence of cassowary harvesting and rearing in this manner hmm. in New Guinea that falls well in line with the evidence provided in this paper. Um, we know that cassowary chicks imprint fairly well with human owners and remain fairly tame as they age. And we have recorded instances of eggs and birds being reared and relocated to other sites of residence. In fact, this practice continues to this day. Um, now, that these activities were occurring well into the Pleistocene was a remarkable surprise, mm. you know, especially since there was also no evidence that these birds were being actively hunted yeah. as adults. And we only have very limited cases of this going back to the mid Holocene, at least. Um, and this is very important. Uh, you know, cassowaries are considered keystone species in the New Guinea rainforests, and they're, they're, they're seed dispersers of several plants. And so their presence in particular areas of forest are a good sign that the habitat is healthy. And you know, while we have evidence of forest clearance in New Guinea, especially in the highlands where agriculture developed, you know, the maintenance of cassowaries through rearing and not through hunting is a sign that the people in this part of the island had a very good understanding of forest ecology. You know, there, there, there was a good balance struck between the birds and the people. And, you know, they, they were able to live together without harming the rainforest, hmm. which is pretty awesome, I think. Um, so, yeah, just, a, you know, another remarkable study showing that you know, again, like even for a, an animal as large and potentially dangerous as a cassowary, people were able to take them in somehow and, and begin a process of rearing and harvesting that has continued for tens of thousands of years. Mm -hmm. um, it's just absolutely remarkable. Uh, what do you think, Albert? Oh, yeah, this was an extremely cool study. Um, and yeah, I definitely definitely um kind of uh hits the sweet spot of both of our interests i think um and uh no i i, I thought it was re really really cool that uh this kind of uh these kinds of interactions um happened um so long ago and yeah i, I think um i think it also kind of kind of emphasizes something that i mentioned in in dinosaurs the second chapter about um how uh, kind of the the monstrousness of cassowaries is frequently exaggerated, I think, um, mm. in, in popular uh, perception these days. Um, uh, yeah, it, it is true that they are potentially dangerous animals and worthy of respect, um, and they do look quite intimidating. But but yeah, they're you know in at the end of the day, they're they're not like hyper aggressive things that you just cannot cannot live with at all. And clearly, uh, this is a pretty strong demonstration of that. I mean, it, it makes me think about, like, nowadays, and, like, people keep emus. Yeah, right, And, right. and ostriches mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in, in, you know, farm-like settings. Um, again, they're not domesticated animals. Right, right. But mm. it's really no different from this. And then, uh, I guess, I don't know, it, it's kind of funny to me that for most of the, like, the giant flightless birds that we have today, at least of the paleomyth variety, yeah. mm. that humans have found some way to, like, use them intimately with their daily lives mm. um like uh, uh, the rhea i think is I don't, I don't think i don't think there's evidence that rhea's were being kept in captivity mm. in this sort of way i'd have to check the literature right, right. i'm only familiar with you know how the gauchos used the, yeah, the rhea's yeah. you know they, they they go on horseback and they they hunt them down using the bolus that's right really yeah. cool. it's like a it's like a how would you describe it it's like a slingshot with that you spin on your hand and there's like little balls on the end of it. Right. And you chuck it at the bird 
and the spinning motion like hooks the legs together and it right. keeps the bird from moving and then you can get some tasty Rhea. <laughs> um, but uh yeah, I I um I think it's just kind of funny that like these three types of birds, ostriches, emus, and cassowaries have just been taken up by human cultures in, in various ways mm -hmm. and that's kind of also helped their conservation a little bit. Um as far as I understand, like the ostriches, the emu, and the cassowary groups, for the most part, are not under severe threat as far as like hunting is concerned. Uh, hmm. I, I think some of the cassowaries are, are in danger due to yeah. habitat destruction. Right, right. Um, but like they're not being like you know pursued to extinction like mm. other species have, um, which is kind of a nice change of pace from the past. I mean, yeah. I know we've we've lost species of emus and ostriches before because of, of such activities. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Not to okay. mention some of the more famous flightless birds. Right, like right. So, yeah, I, th I thought this was kind of a, a neat study, and I, I definitely look forward to other examples of this in the near future, because I'm, I'm sure, you know, as people dig in the ethnographic literature and they go into the archaeological record, yeah. um, they can see just like this, ex this examples, these examples of, of wild animals being harvested and reared um that is just yeah just so prevalent around the world mm -hmm. um yeah mm. yeah and definitely definitely not always kind of the species of wildlife you'd expect uh yeah no, very 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 cool that's for sure <laughs> absolutely um but all right um that is it for our stories mm -hmm. um if you don't have anything else to add albert we'll go to our our, our usual um ending here yep hmm. uh of course uh we are on patreon um if you are interested in supporting the show and, and and donating some money to for us to help you know contribute to the series um you can go to our website at patreon.com slash time clades of course your contributions help us you know continue the series and develop new projects and expansions mm -hmm. uh, like, like the website. our website for example mm -hmm. yeah and uh uh, we're working slowly and, and surely with that. It, every little bit helps, absolutely. Um, of course, we'd like to thank our, our good friends, Henry and Alicia, for their contributions to this series. Of course, Henry's behind the wonderful theme music, and uh, Alicia created the color scheme for Albert's adorable Albert's or <laughs> avatar. <laughs> A little alliteration there. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, uh, we post updates on Twitter. We are at Time and Clates, where we usually... You know, upload announcements as well as episodes as they are completed um and of course you're most likely watching us on youtube through time and clades uh, if you'd like to subscribe and follow us uh, we certainly appreciate that um and if you have questions for us you are more than welcome to drop a comment in the comments section we'll almost certainly get to them or of course you can send them to our email time and at gmail.com and of course as always for this series um we have references in the description if mm -hmm. you'd like to go to these particular papers and look at them uh i think for the most part all of these are open access so that's a big plus yeah mm -hmm. um, and you can you can look at them and you can also find the recordings for those those musk dust oh that's right yes i'm going to do as soon as i can <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and crack up at those yep um yeah with that uh, this is the end of our series um for today uh Albert, as you mentioned before, um, at some point in the near future, we will see the update special to Dinosaurs, the second chapter. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, uh, we will do that eventually. Uh, we haven't decided exactly when, uh, but perhaps later this month. Um, that w I think that would be nice. Um, but yeah, um, until then, uh, I suppose we'll see you around and uh, take care, everybody. Stay safe. Yes, thanks for joining us. Have a good day.